We learn an awful lot of the, the complications of measuring sleep and reporting it to people. Um, it's it's a it's a complex thing. You, you know, when you think about sleep, the subjective experience is I close my eyes, I become completely unconscious, and then at some point my eyes open and I'm conscious again. Uh, one, we have no idea what happened there, and two, if somebody said you could measure it, you'd think it would be pretty straightforward. Um, turns out when you record one night of sleep, one, one recording, and you have two people look at that same recording, they can come up with very different answers, even with the gold standard rules that have been around for 40 years. Um, and so, you know, an average agreement between two people is about 85%. And I'm throwing this up there to give us a little understanding so when we talk about how we validated Zio and what those numbers look like, how do they compare to this, this 85? Um, another thing to, to look at is the subjective report of sleep. When people talk about how deep their sleep was or how restorative their sleep was, it has basically zero correlation with what was actually happening in terms, in terms of your sleep architecture. There might be a little bit around how much deep sleep you got. Actually, the more deep sleep you get can make your subjective report worse. Um, but that's that's all very tenuous. It's not very it's not a very strong connection. Um, this is especially true in a very light sleep and REM sleep, um, where people don't have the subjective experience of whether I'm asleep or not. Another thing, so we, we know that sleep is a subjective measure. Uh, another thing we have to keep keep in mind is that we're when we're talking about PSG, the gold standard, we're recording sleep from the scalp, mainly from the face, from the head. Uh, there, there's some additional signals around the body, but most of it's up here. Uh, but when you start thinking about it, sleep is really a whole body phenomenon. So if you put your de definition all up here, you're going to be missing some of the data that's elsewhere. Um, this is especially true when you're thinking about uh, circadian rhythms. There's more and more data coming out now that your brain has one circadian phase maker. Uh, and it's called the super, suprachiasmatic nucleus, and there's, you know, it, which is in the pineal gland, which is dictating your body's day-night rhythm. Uh, turns out that all of our organs might have internal circadian clocks that could be running on different times, uh, especially if you're jet lagged or if you're one of those people that likes to sleep in on the weekend uh, to catch up from while sleep during the week. You could be putting your brain on a different schedule than your heart, which is on a different schedule from your liver, which is on a different schedule from your kidneys, and it can really start to screw up your, your ability to sleep, sleep well. Um, the third thing to talk about when, when thinking about the, the gold standard, um, when you're picking up all these electrical activities in the brain, it's, it's aggregate data. You have you know billions of brain cells. The one signal that you're getting is going to be what are all these brain cells doing in concert? When you're in deep sleep, they're all kind of firing at the same time. It's like these big, slow waves. Everything's happening all at once. When you're awake, lots of neurons can be firing in different places at different rates, so you end up with a really noisy, choppy, low amplitude signal. Um, this is especially true uh, in terms of the differences of what's going on in your brain uh, at, at different points. So sleep onset, sleep offset. You think, I fall asleep, that means I'm unconscious. It happens like this. It doesn't. Parts of your brain, uh, I can't remember which direction it is, but you know your, hip, your, your, your hippocampus is falling asleep at a slightly different time than, than your cortex. And it kind of propagates back and forth. Uh, and that's, that's it, onset and sleep onset. So there's a couple of minutes, perhaps, when you're falling asleep, when you're waking up, where you're actually sort of in between the two. And it's really difficult to define whether you were awake or asleep, objectively and subjectively. Um, Again, with the, the aggregate sleep data, sleep spindles, those things that I mentioned before, those don't just happen brain-wide. It's not like your whole brain just freaks out and creates this, this spindle uh, feature. What happens is it, it generally uh, happens, it, it occurs, it starts in one place, and then propagates uh, to the rest of your brain. It's kind of this really, really cool phenomenon if you look at some of the MRI data about how sleep spindles propagate. It's actually very, very fascinating data. Um, and then a third thing to think about is that some of these features that we talk about in sleep, you know, I've mentioned these big slow waves you get during deep sleep, those occur more, more up front. Uh, you're going to get more amplitude, uh, more, more concerted activity up here. Uh, a feature of being awake um, and a quiet wake, when you close your eyes and you're awake and you relax, uh, most people, something like 90-95% of the population has to create, create what's called alpha waves. It's a very distinct feature, uh, but that happens all back here. So if you're recording something up here, 
you're not going to pick up that, that key indicator of waveform that's coming from the back of the head. 